All right, Steve, welcome to the show. Good to be here. Yeah, so tell us about your background and how you got started as an author and a writer. Well, I was a lawyer. I was a practicing lawyer for 30 years, and uh, I had a little voice in my head that tells me to write. Every writer I've ever met has a little voice in their head, and it doesn't tell you to write a bestseller or anything like that. It just says, well, you just sit down and write. If you'll sit down and write, I'll be happy. If you don't, I'm just going to keep nagging at you every day. And that little voice nagged at me for about 10 years, all during the 1980s, and finally in 1990, I listened to it and started to write. I, uh, Learned though, after about a year or so, that writing is very hard and it's very difficult. And so I had to begin to learn the craft of writing. And over the next 12 years, I taught myself craft of writing. I wrote eight manuscripts. Five of those went to New York houses. They were rejected 85 times. So it was a it was a very long process for me during those 12 years before I finally sold my first word and uh, and got to uh, to be a published writer. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's quite a journey. 85 rejection letters. Most people would give up, you know, after that many. What kept you going? I gave up after I gave up three times. I'm not going to say that I did. I quit three times. It was the little voice in my head that always came back and said, "No, enough. Get back to work. Go to work. You know, get back in there and write." And I stuck with it. And then finally, one day, 12 years after I wrote my first word, I sold it. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. Congratulations. And now you've sold, what, over 17 million books worldwide? Pushing 18 million now. Yeah, wow. we're, yeah we're in uh, 50 countries around the world. Yeah, that's impressive. So so what was the point along the way where you said, you know, you mentioned this little voice in your head that made you keep going. Um, what was it about that, do you think, that just made you have to keep writing even when you couldn't get your books published? It, it, there's no other way to explain it. It's just a little voice, and it's still there today. It still drives me crazy every day when I don't write for a couple of days. It says, what are you doing? Get to work. It's a little nagging voice, and every writer I've ever met says the same thing. They have the same little voice. Because, you know, writing is, is a pretty miserable experience when you get right down to it now. I mean, it's a very negative experience. If you're going to go in there and you're going to be a commercial fiction writer, you're going to write books for a living, you're going to deal with a lot of rejection, and you're going to hear a lot of negativity. You're going to hear a lot more negativity than you will ever hear anything positive. The only thing that keeps you going is the little voice that drives you forward because there's very little reward in it. I mean, over those 12 years of rejection, my my, you can count on one hand the number of times I had any reward, uh, but I had an enormous amount of uh, negativity. So that little voice is a very comforting thing to have. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, what have you done since your book was published, you know, since your first book was published, what have you done to, you know, build your author platform? Because a lot of authors think, you know, that's the key to getting a contract now is to have a strong author platform. No, the key to getting a contract is to write a good book. Uh, definitely to write a good book. You have to write a good book. You have to sit down, you have to write a book that's well crafted, you have to have a good story. You have to put all of that together. That's the number one thing that you have to have is a good book, a good manuscript, a well put together. Now, once you have done that and you're contra and you've been bought, and someone is going to publish your work and put it out there, and you're going to market that work in the in the in the marketplace, then you need a platform. Yes, you need a website. You need all kinds of things to put in place and to help market that book. But I tell writers all the time, and I get very agitated with writers sometimes. To put the cart before the horse. Uh, you've got to write the book, and you've got to learn the craft of writing, and you've got to put that together, and you've got to have a mastery of that before you can even think about selling anything. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So let's step back then and talk about how did you develop that craft. I mean, you mentioned you taught yourself over 12 years. You know, what did that consist of? What was your, you know, program for learning, so to speak? Writing every day. I got myself down, and I did my thousand words every day. And I went. Writers workshop every Wednesday night for six years, and I took my my chapter, I read it out loud, and it was destroyed. I'd come back home and I'd rewrite it, and I'd learn, and I'd go back and I'd destroy it again, and I'd go back, and I did this over and over and over, and over a period of time, you begin to teach yourself the craft of writing. There is no such thing as a writing teacher. If someone's looking for someone to teach you how to write, that is impossible. There's no such thing. But there are people who can help teach you how to teach you how to write. Yes, there are. 
And those folks you need to find. And once you find them, you've got to learn those techniques of how to teach you how to teach you how to write. And I was lucky enough to find some folks who helped me with that. Over the course of those 12 years, I taught myself the craft of writing from, from writing every day, trial and error, over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's, that's what it takes because it's like, you know, there's so much to it. Like writing is so complex and there's so many minutiae you don't even realize when you first start out that if you don't just keep practicing and get the feedback, like you said, from local writers, groups, or mentors and coaches, you know, it's impossible to learn it all from a book or something like that. No, it's, no, you can't. You, you have to read your genre, you have to keep reading your genre, you have to study your genre, and you have to write every day. And if you'll do that, and you get the right feedback, and you're open-minded, and you, and you work at it every day, you can teach yourself the craft of writing. That's the cool thing about writing. It is an acquired skill, and anybody can acquire it. There's no limitations. There's no restrictions. Anybody can acquire the skill if you want. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, I mean, what were some of the biggest lessons, maybe the top one or two lessons you learned about the craft of writing along the way? Well, I learned a lot. I learned, I learned 11 rules of writing, you know, and I teach those when I teach the craft of writing. There's a whole bunch of things you, you learn about what to do and what not to do. Uh, and, you, and, you, and you fashion those, and you, you go by those rules. Things like don't bore the reader, don't confuse the reader, shorter is always better. These kinds of things that you learn, the rules that I came across that I've stuck with uh, over, you know, now going on 25 years. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Well, and I know you write historical fiction, and there's just a ton of research that goes into your books and on your blog, your website. You talk about all the research you've done for your books. Tell us about that process. Well, my books are international suspense thrillers. They're modern-day thrillers that have a historical hook to them. And I do. I, once I latch onto a subject, I spend about three to four hundred, and I usually consult three to four hundred written sources uh, going through those books, large chunks, if not all of those books. And there's usually one or two trips associated with each novel. And then I have to accumulate all that information, get it into a format that I can access easily. And then I go through it, and I'm only going to use about 20, 25 percent of whatever I find. Can't use it all. I'm not writing an encyclopedia. I'm writing a thriller, so I have to entertain you. So I go through that whole process, and it's an 18-month process for me from start to finish. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So I mean, why go through all that trouble to write a book? I mean, why don't you just write, you know, just a commercial fiction book you can slap out in a couple months? It's my kind of book. It's not what I, you know, you you don't write what you know in this business. That's hard advice. You write what you love. And I like action, history, secrets, conspiracies, international settings. I like it as close to reality as possible. I like a lot of history hooked into it, things you don't know a whole lot about. I like a little mystery. I like all those things in there, and those take time. I have to dig all that out. It's just the kind of book that I love. That's what I write. Uh, yeah, it'd be great if I could just bang out a story where A goes to B, goes to C, and C goes to D, and you just take it right through, and when you get done, it's over with. That would be... Uh, Wonderful, but it's not my kind of book. I don't. I don't think my. I think my readers would be. What happened? Uh, what happened? It's not what I. That's not what I write. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. And so, what I've noticed, you know, with all your books on Amazon, you kind of stay focused on that one genre, right? I mean, have you really stretched out into other genres, or are you really just focused on an international thriller? Well, not at this point, just in that one genre, because that's what my readers really like. What building audience. I'd love to branch out to other genres. I'd love to write a science fiction book. I'd love to write a pure historical fiction book set you know, in, in, in a historical setting. Uh, maybe even a fantasy book would be kind of cool. So uh, uh, I'd love to branch out one day, but for the foreseeable future, I'll be writing international suspense thrillers. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So what's your favorite part about the writing process? Yeah, when you write the last word and you're done, that's a, that's a wonderful experience. Uh, I never have to read that book again. I never have to study anything on that book again. You have to realize I go through my novels around 70 times from start to finish. So I read the book 70 times. And if you want to know how horrible that is, get a book and read it 70 times, and you'll see what I mean. And I just, I'm tickled to death when it's done, when I'm completely finished, and I never have to read it again. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Well, that's impressive. I mean, 70 read-throughs, 70 edits. 
Uh, I would say that's probably above average. <laughs> right. I would think so, but it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. You're not going through your menu 40, 50, 60, 70 times. You're not doing it much justice. Now, I'm not reading every word on all of those. 35 of those are, I'm looking for just certain things like verbs or repeat words or something like that. But 30 or 35 of those are complete rereads, start to finish every single word, continuity reads, to make sure they make sense. So, you know, I, if you're not doing that, you're not you're not really giving yourself, uh, you're not doing justice to your writing because one of the rules of writing is writing is rewriting. It's about over and over and over again. Mm, absolutely. Yeah, that's an impressive commitment, and that's awesome that you're sharing that because, you know, what I've seen personally from working with a lot of authors as a coach and as a publisher is a lot of authors just don't invest that many that much time in rewriting. No, and you can tell when you read the manuscript that they haven't done it. Uh, I can tell when I read some manuscripts, some first manuscripts, that a lot of a lot of stuff, a lot of times, not been placed into it. But you can see the mistakes that are in there. You can see things that would come out through careful editing. One of the things writers don't learn today, and one of the things that was hammered into me was the art of self-editing. I was taught how to self-edit myself, and, and and writers today don't do that. They think someone else is going to do it for you. First mm -hmm. off, that's not going to happen. Second off, even if it was, you don't want someone else editing you. You want someone else going through your book when you're completely done 30, 40, 50, 60 times with it and offering another perspective to it, that would be fine. But if you're relying on someone else to make your manuscript read smooth, then you're in for a rude awakening because there's no one out there that's going to do that. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. That's awesome. That's awesome advice, I think, for a lot of authors out there. Uh, you mentioned you know going through the editing process. You 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 edit your book yourself 40 or 50 times before you even hand it off to an editor. Correct. Yeah. I mean, I don't. Uh, when my editor gets it, I've gone through it through it the 60, 70 times, and I'm still going to go through it another four or five after he's done. I'm not done when you know, just because he's got it, but, but he gets a pretty clean manuscript. Uh, I, like I said, my my editor you know they, they line edit, but they don't have to do a lot of of heavy line editing on my stuff. No. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Well, what about beta readers, or is there anyone else that you go to for feedback on your earlier versions of your manuscript? Only my editor and my agent and my wife. They're the only three people who actually look at the manuscript. No one else uh, looks at it. Uh, and it wouldn't do me any good for anyone else to look at it because, it, you know, I need people who understand what's going on and understand the process and understand what we're doing, familiar with the work, it wouldn't do me any good to other people to read it. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Well, I mean, what do you do, like, you know, after your 15th or 20th edit, I mean, don't you get bored <laughs> reading the manuscript again and again? Horribly, horribly. You get sick and tired of it. You get, you get just completely, but the little voice comes in. The little voice says, too bad that you're sick and tired. It's what you have to do. It's the process. Sit down and do it. The little voice keeps you on track. The little voice says, you know what's going to happen when you get done with this reread? It's going to be so much better and you're going to be much happier. And I am happier when I get done with it. It reads much better. The little voice makes it better. It's, as I said earlier, writing is a miserable experience. It is not something you stand every day and say, this is just so wonderful that I get to sit here and pull my brains out for the next five or six hours to figure out what to write down here. It's very difficult to, sit, to make yourself sit down and do that every day. And it, it's hard, and there's very little reward to it. But one of the rewards is getting it better. When you're done and you read it and you go, wow, that read pretty good. That read a lot better than it did a week ago, a lot better than it did two weeks ago. And you can actually see the changes. See, I, I cringe all the time when writers are compared to other writers. I don't like to be compared to anybody. I like to be compared to me. Me to me. Me to me is a very good comparison and a very meaningful comparison. And I make those comparisons all the time in private, over and over again. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So your goal is basically just get this get this next draft better than the one before it. And as right. long as you accomplish that, then you're on track. As long as it's getting better, because all the writers can hope for is what they wrote today is better than yesterday. And what they write tomorrow is better than today. That's all you can ever hope for. It doesn't get any better than that right there. You're never going to get it perfect. You're never going to get it exact. You're just going to get it a little bit better every day. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So would you say you're a little bit of a perfectionist when it comes to writing? 
Yeah, I would say so in, in a point, but now I don't go crazy. I know when to stop. I know when there's a stopping point. And and that stopping point's okay, that's it. I've done all I can do with it, I'm done. And I and that process usually takes me twelve months. And I know when that process is over. So I don't keep going over and over and over. And when I read it um, three months later, I don't sit around and lament how much better it could have been. Once I'm done, I'm done, and I've done the best I could, and I turn it in, then I'm done. And, and you move on. Reading is a discipline. You have to be disciplined. You have to stick to the discipline, but it is not an obsession. You cannot get obsessed with it. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So how do you know when you're done after the 50th, 60th edit? How do you know when it's, you know, it's time to send it off the editor? As you read the draft and you'll go five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve pages and you're making no changes, or you're making just minor little word, one word here, one word there, and, and, it, and it's reading very smoothly. The paragraphs are blending together. The sentences are blending together. The chapters are blending together. There's no chop. You're, you're not chopped or like start jarred out of it when you're reading. It's reading smooth, clean. You know that rhythm because one of the rules of writing is writing is rhythm. And when you see and feel that rhythm, you know it's there. And that's not a conceit and that's not being braggy. But there is a point where you have to tell yourself, you know, that reads pretty good. That ain't bad. That's the best I can do. That's the best I can churn out at this moment in time. That's as good as it can get. Now, a year from now, I'm going to write a little better. But right now, that's as best as I can do. And you'll know that feeling. You'll know, you'll know it when you, when you go through it. That's after you've been through it 50, 40, 50, 60 times, though, if you've only been through your manuscript three or four times, you're not going to experience that feeling. That's impossible. Mm, yeah, because you're always going to be wondering, no, what about this mistake or that mistake or what about this section or that idea? Or that scene? Maybe change. If you're, if you're constantly editing one sentence after another, changing, 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 that shows you right there. When I get to that 60th or 70th read, I'm touching maybe a third every four or five pages by that point. I'm barely touching anything at that point. It's a slight little final edit. That's when you know you've got it. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So how much time do you spend every day on writing and editing? Uh, it's a job. I work, uh, I work around five hours in the mornings from around 7, 6.37 to about 11. I take an hour off or so, and I come back working a couple of hours. So I put in a good six or seven hours every day when I'm churning out the book, and that takes me about 10 months, 10 months of solid work. It's not always in a row because sometimes I have to travel and all. But starting around August 1st, it'll start pretty solid. August till about February, I'll work pretty much six hours a day as I finish up the 2016 novel. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So after your book's been edited, you send it to the editor. You know, you got your final draft. Everything's ready to go. You know, what do you do to build your author platform and to start marketing the books? Well, I have a publisher who takes care of a lot of that, but I, I, I don't rely on them to do all of that. I'm very much involved in that process. So I have, I have Facebook, which I work very heavily, and we, we rely on our Facebook friends and likes for pre-orders, and they've been very good about helping with my pre-orders over the years. We also have a website in which we get 500 to 700 sessions a day, people coming on, spending around two minutes of their time, every day. So that, that translates to around 200,000 sessions a year. So we maintain that and keep it up. It's a way of communication. We do a newsletter around eight to ten times a year. So we keep up with, uh, we, we get information out to everyone. We have an app in which we keep current and we keep information going on that. These are all things we communicate. And then I deal with the marketing of the books, the advertising of the books. I get very heavily involved in taglines and how the ads read and the creative part process of that. I'm very much involved in all of that. And all writers should get involved in that. They need to, they, no one knows more about how to market their book than they do. And they need to get involved in this book is to be perceived by people. Now, you've got to learn the business. And, over, and I have done that over the course of the last 12 years. I've learned. Uh, how this business works in a lot of ways, and I'm still learning every day. It's a really complicated process, and the rules change every single day. We talk about the good old days. That was about three months ago.
was the good old days. That's how fast things are changing. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Well, walk us through one of your recent books that you just launched and kind of you know your idea or your philosophy behind the branding and the positioning of it. Well, the book right now, The Lincoln Myth, uh, we wanted to market that book to the conservative right reader because we felt like they would really enjoy that novel. It's a, it's a theme that they would really could sink their teeth into. So we marketed the book on uh, conservative internet sites like the Rush Limbaugh site, the Glenn Beck site, the Brit- Britbart site. Uh, we, were, we were on places where conservative book buyers go. I, was managed, I managed to snag an appearance on Lou Dobbs. So I was on Lou Dobbs, which was wonderful, and he loved the book, and the audience is my audience. So you, you look at your novel, and you say, what's your audience? Who are you after? Who do you want to read this book? Who do you want to buy this book? And we knew that book would, would appeal to that audience, and sure enough, it did. They went after it in droves, and the book debuted at number three on the New York Times e-list and four on the hardcover list. So it, you know the marketing of that book and the targeting of that audience worked very well. We geared our ads to that audience too. We wanted ads that would attract their attention. We wanted taglines that would attract their attention, and, and we did. We came up with those. Those actually did work, and uh, the book is still doing well after we're five weeks out, and it's still selling very solid. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Well, and I, I listened to another podcast interview you did recently. And you were, you know, the, the host was talking about how your books are basically multi-genre. So, you know, you've got this historical element, you've got this, you know, thriller, suspense element. So, you know, most authors, when they're brand new, they just tend to write in, you know, several different genres. Like your book is a blend, right? So it's got romance or thriller, all these different things in it. But then there's like the branding and positioning of your book. So how do you know, like, when you come out with a book... You know, what is, how do you know what that one message is you want to share with people? Like, how did you know that you wanted to share that, that book with conservatives? Well, I just, knew that, I just knew that the question of succession, which is what this book deals with, is a topic matter that the, the, that the writer would be interested in. It's a subject matter that interests them. Uh, and so, you know, it, it, it just made sense that that would be something they would be interested in looking at. The question of Lincoln. Lincoln is a very much a... Uh, a hero to them. I noticed behind your shoulder there seems to be a picture of Lincoln back there. Uh, yes. Is that my honor? <laughs> no, it's actually uh, he's actually one of my one of my role models as well. Oh, he's back there. Uh, Lincoln is a, is a political figure that, that that the right really likes. And so I knew that when I put all these elements together I had something. So we said, well, since we have it, let's market the book to folks that would actually like it. And sure enough, it did. Mm. Yeah, it sounds so simple, but <laughs> well, it, it it is simple uh, once you figure out what to do. But uh, not all the books are quite that easy. You know, some of my books uh, don't appeal to either side, they, or they appeal to both sides. Uh, lately, I've been a, uh, my my topics have appealed a little more to uh, next year's book deals with, with would deal with that. Uh, last year's book, The King's Deception, was well, the either side would enjoy because it dealt with Elizabeth I out of England. And both sides did seem to like it. So you you got to think about your audience when you get ready to market that novel. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. So I mean, how do you stay in touch with your audience and learn from them? I mean, do you constantly are you reading your reviews on Amazon? Are you you know reading emails from readers? How do you stay in touch with your audience and make sure that what you're writing is really relevant to them? Well, we get about I don't know between fifty and a hundred emails a week. When the book is out, it's more, but when you average it out, it's probably, we get around 2,500 to 3,000 emails a year, Um, and I read every one, every single one. I don't answer every one. I have a a young lady who works for me, and she answers them for me as her, not as me, but her. I answer a few. If there's a few, if it comes on and says me or says I, then that's me. If it's Jessica, she says it's Jessica. Um, And... I read every one of them, so I, I see what they're saying. Um, I do read reviews on Amazon. I do read those. Um, some of the reviews make sense. And some of the criticism is valid. I have actually modified the way I write a novel based on some of that criticism that I heard over and over again. And since I made those changes, I haven't heard that criticism, so I, I paid attention to that. And that comes back from my training in a writer's workshop where I was taught in a critical way. So I actually listened to what they had to say there and made some adjustments. So 
you know, I say all the time, no writer ever got better being told by being told how great they are. You have to listen to criticism. If it's valid, if it's not, ignore it. Now you may say, well, how do I know the difference? Well, it's tough. Time teaches you the difference. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So, I mean, how did you surround yourself with people who could help you become a better writer? Well, it was just, I kind of lucked into it, to be honest with you. I didn't really surround myself. I, 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 the gentleman who runs the workshop uh, heard about me and gave me a call and said that he thought I might benefit from it. At this point, I, I was still writing my very first manuscript, you know, second manuscript, I think it was at that point. And, of course, I went to the workshop thinking I knew everything. I was Mr. Know-it-all. I was already knew how to write. I didn't need anyone to teach me anything or, or even to show me anything. And I got quickly a rude awakening of just how stupid I truly was. And for the first couple of years of the workshop, I was fairly lost. It was about the third year when I began to get a handle on it. And by the sixth year, I, w I had a handle on it. Because you have to understand, 75% of what you hear in a writer's workshop is pure garbage. It's trash. You never want to remember a word of it. But 25% of what you hear is gold, absolute pure gold that you will live or die by. And I still, to this day, live or die by that goal. Now, how do you know the difference? Definitely. Time teaches you the difference. It teaches you. And that's how it was with me. And I learned that difference. And when I teach my writer's workshop today as part of History Matters, as our foundation that we raise money for historic preservation with, I teach that gold in those four hours. The, the, they actually get to hear gold without going through the garbage. And, and we've taught around 2,600 students in those workshops. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So where can people find out more info about you, the workshops that you're doing? You can go to my website, steveberry.org. Go to the uh, events section, and you'll see we're doing uh, one more this year. It's in Canada. Our very first one uh, internationally is on Prince Edward Island in Canada in August. It's the last workshop this year. I've already done about four this year. We do around six to eight History Matters events a year, so uh, we're planning the 2015 events now. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So tell us about your organization called History Matters. My wife Elizabeth and I created it. It's a uh, we, we came up with a way to raise money for historic preservation. There's no money for that anymore. So we came up with a way, kind of innovative, We'll go into a community and we do whatever they need. If they need us to do a meet and greet, they need us to do dinner and a speech, whatever you want me to do, where people pay to come. Or we can do our writer's workshop. We can do that too. And I've done that as well. All of the money we raise from the event goes to the project we're there to promote. We've done around 75 or 80 of these events over the last four years. We've raised around three quarters of a million dollars for historic projects. Elizabeth and I don't charge to come. We don't charge any expenses or anything. We have our own way to be there. So every dime we raise goes to the historic preservation project we're there to promote. In Canada, it's the a couple of projects that they're doing up there, one to honor their World War I veterans and another to acquire some historic artifacts. And we'll be raising some money up there through a meet and greet, a dinner, um, a barbecue for some folks who are a VIP kind of barbecue, and I'm teaching a writer's so we're hoping to raise between ten and twenty thousand dollars over the day and a half that we're there. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So how did that project come about? I mean, was that something you dreamed of doing ever since you were a struggling author, just getting started, or was that something that happened after that? It happened during the tours when we were touring around over the first five or six books, and then finally in two thousand eight, we came up with the idea and said, "Well, why don't we just start trying to give back some?" So we created History Matters in two thousand and nine. And now we're in our fifth year, and it's really caught on. We've done very well out there. And if anyone has a project they think that we might be interested in, you can go to my website, steveberry.org, and uh, click on the uh, History Matters. Send us an email, and we'll see if we can come and help you out. Awesome. That's very kind of you. Thank you so much. So uh, tell us about you know kind of the news and where you get your information about the publishing business, because I know there's this whole – news right now about Hachette and Amazon, their negotiations, and you know, there's all this stuff going on in the industry right now. How much of that do you pay attention to, and how much of that do you just ignore if you can focus on writing? Well, I, I pay attention to the business of writing a lot. I spend two to three hours every day dealing with the business of writing, every day. Uh, so, yes, I read Publishers Weekly. I read all of the trade 
uh, journals, all the things dealing with publishing. I, I ask a lot of questions. I'm very inquisitive. I keep right up with it. And if you want to be a commercial fiction writer in today's market, you have to be up on that stuff because it literally changes every day. It's a daily event, the changes that are going on. And I keep up with it. I can't imagine how anyone could be a published author today and not be right on top of what's going on in the business. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So what are your main sources, like the top three websites that you go to that you think everyone should read as an author? Well, you should, you should read Publishers, Publishers Weekly. Don't, no, there's no question. That's the, the standard trade journal of all. You get electronically, you can get the, the actual magazine. Uh, and you should go read it cover to cover every week. Uh, Publishers Lunch is something you subscribe to by being in Publishers Weekly, which gives you even more of an inside track. We, and that's what that's what the the industry reads is Publishers Lunch. So if you want to keep up with it, you go in there. It's not very expensive. It's about two hundred dollars a year. But you get something every day. Every day, you get something from Publishers Lunch. So those are your two main ones that you should be really on top of. The rest of it is asking questions, being inquisitive, and and picking the brains of people who are very smart in this business. Mm -hmm. So how do you do that? I mean, do you just you know research people? Do you research other authors that you like and are, are in your field and just send them an email? How do you ask questions? Well, I'm a member of International Thriller Writers, which is a group of 2,600 thriller writers from around the world. And so I have an entire uh, trade group that I can communicate with. And I encourage writers to be members of those organizations. And once you're a member of those organizations, you go to conferences and you go to these places. You go there to learn and to get your ears open and to pay attention and to see what you can learn from other people who are in the trenches fighting every day. And Thriller Fest, we have that every year. That goes on every year in New York City, first week of July. This week, it will this year going on uh, starting, I think, July 7th or 8th, going through the 11th, is Thriller Fest. And it's the gathering of the thriller genre. It's uh, a great place. Any thriller writers out there should be at Thriller Fest you will learn an enormous amount of information. There's a lot of very smart people there that you can pick their brains. And that's what it's all about. These conferences aren't about going there and how many books can I sell and how many people can I see and how many autographs can I sign. That's got nothing to do with it. You need to go to these conferences to learn from people who are in the trenches every day and get the information you need to make good, informed decisions. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. That's such great advice, you know, because I think that's really what it takes. You know, there's this kind of myth that as an author you can just sit in your room all day and write at the computer and, you know, you'll be famous. But, you know, you really have to get out there, go to these conferences, meet other authors, and, you know, learn from them because, you know, we all pull each other up. We all educate each other. We, no, no one knows everything, right? Exactly right, and that's why you have to quiz everyone. Fest is wonderful. They're some of the smartest people in the business, and they're there for four or five days, editors, agents, press, Publishers, you name it, they're all there, and they're all accessible, and you can and you can learn from them. Our panels are very informative. Our panels are very uh, oriented to the business. Uh, we have Craft Fest on Wednesday, where 30 of the biggest writers in the business are teaching each other the craft of writing, and this is all open to the public. People can come. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So, you know, you probably get a ton of emails, you know, you mentioned all the emails you get from, from aspiring authors and aspiring writers. What are the kind of the, the most frequently asked questions that people ask you about writing and publishing? Well, they, they want to know, how do I get an agent? How do I get published? How, how can I shortcut this? Unfortunately, shortcut doesn't exist. You have, to, you have to write the manuscripts, you have to take your lumps, and you have to go in there and you have to plow at it. There is no shortcut to it. They're all looking for a quick fix. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't. You have to. You have to do this the hard way, the long way, and that's mainly what I get questions from. Is that how do I make this happen? You make it happen by writing every day. Keep writing every day. Submit your manuscripts. Hang out and keep going until one day you catch a break, and you will. The you know Bobby Jones said, the harder he practiced, the luckier he got, and that's exactly the way writing is too. So you just have to hang in there. And I tell people all the time, I am living proof that it can be done. 12 years, 85 rejections before I met. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, I mean, have you ever felt like you were just completely stuck, either with a manuscript or, you know, stuck because you couldn't get published? I mean, what do you do? Because I feel like a lot of authors, they, they email me and they say that, you know, they're stuck. They don't know what to do next. Well, 
if they've got a manuscript finished that they've been through 50, 60, 70 times and they're comfortable and they feel like that's the best thing they can possibly write at that moment in time, then it's time to find an agent. And go find an agent. I did it the old-fashioned way. I got the guide to literary agents. I took out. I wrote about 400 letters and I pulled them out. And, and that's what you do today. Today you do letters, emails, there's all kinds of ways. You can come to Thriller Fest and go to Agent Fest where there's 70 of the biggest agents in the business in one room. And you get to speed date. And you get to talk to about 12 to 15 of those over a three-hour period. Every three minutes we ring a bell and you move to the next agent. Uh, these are all things available to you. If you want it bad enough, you've got to work for it. You've got to make it happen. There is no shortcut. No one's going to make it easy for you. You have to make it happen, and you have to hang in there and go at it. I didn't know the first thing about how to sell a manuscript, but I taught myself. I got the stuff. I learned, and I learned from messing up. I learned from rejection. I learned from making mistakes, and that's the way people have to learn. The problem with today is people aren't patient. They want it now, and I want it immediately. Well, it's not going to happen. I can tell you now, it ain't going to happen. Uh, Yes, every once in a while someone sells a manuscript and it becomes a blowout. Yes, it does. But your chances are better at winning the lottery than that actually happening to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it really is about sticking with it and, you know, constantly oh, learning, yeah. constantly improving, constantly submitting, constantly rewriting until, you know, someone, until basically you're good enough. Do you catch a break? It's cliche. Yes, it is. But you cannot give up. You have mm -hmm. to hang with it. Stay with it, and one day you'll catch a break. And that's what happened to me. One day I caught a break. One day in May 2002, I caught a break. They luck on my way one time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, do you think there's a lot of luck involved with that? I mean, a lot of authors talk about, you know, their lucky break. You know, do you think that is luck? You make you your own luck. You make your own luck by hanging in there. I made my own luck by hanging in there until until the world caught up with me and the publishers were looking for the kind of book I was writing. The world changed, caught up, and I caught a break because I hung in there long enough to be there when the break happened. No one no one made that happen. I made that happen by not quitting. If I quit, I would have never been there at that moment. But I was. And that's what, that's what I tell everyone else, too. Your break will come. I had studied my genre, I had studied everything, and I felt like the international suspense thriller was going to make a comeback. And I was right. It did make a comeback in 2003 with the publishing of Da Vinci Code, and that's how I got published. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome, Steve. Well, you shared a wealth of wisdom with us today. I really appreciate it. Glad to do it. Yeah, so before you go, share with us where people can find out more info about you and your books. Everything can be found about me at steveberry.org. Everything's at that website. They can learn everything about me. I encourage everyone to check it out. Awesome. Thank you so much, Steve. I really Thanks. appreciate it. All right. Bye-bye.